So just, uh, I have been trained as a developmental psychologist. I'm also a psychologist as, uh, and therefore, uh, yeah, the theoretical background, of course, has been in developmental psychology for long years. Piaget, who thought that children develop by just, uh, yeah, having, uh, by just building better thinking. I think most of you are familiar with Piaget and uh, probably you remember these kind of tasks where young children don't know uh, that uh, the number of uh, objects doesn't increase if uh, the objects are spread or if they are uh, just uh, no, uh, moved in the opposite direction. Uh, Piaget thought that children are not really flexible in thinking. They are not able to think in a reverse way or the uh, very famous problem is this one, that they have, uh, do not have perspective taking. Uh, if young children are asked uh, what, uh, which mountain is seen by the doll, uh, very uh, often children answer the uh, mountain says, uh, they saw. And the, all this kind of uh, yeah, material or insights developed by Piaget, they were focused on the aspect that young children uh, do not think in the same advanced way as older children do. Uh, this approach has been changed uh, in the la last decades. Uh, to put it very simply, Piaget thought, uh, or would have answered the question, what develops in childhood better thinking? But we know, now know it's not better thinking. Children sometimes can think very logically, but they, what they are missing is the knowledge. So the modern approach is not better thinking, but better knowing. And this, uh, to, just to bring two examples, this uh, goes along with the idea of conceptual change, the change from characteristic to defining features. If you ask young children what's uh, really uh, what's uh, a mammal, they say, okay, a uh, dog is a mammal, a cat is a mammal, mammals have fur. That's clear, they can be petted, they have fur. But of course, the biologist, he doesn't want to hear this answer. He wants to hear that uh, yeah, the way of reproduction is different in mammals than in other uh, kinds of animals. But of course, uh, children can't uh, yeah, acquire these concepts just by perception or just by uh, experience. They have to be taught in science classes. A very uh, famous uh, example how conceptual uh, change takes place is, of course, by the uh, most uh, famous person, Susan Carey, on conceptual change. It depends uh, or it uh, describes the concept of weight. So heavy be heavy. Uh, if one asks young children whether a heap of rice has weight, they say, yes, it has. But then if you take a single grain of ri uh, rice, does it have weight? Uh, the children say, no, it doesn't. Uh, and uh, you can uh, just explain whatever you want. They insist a single grain or a single corn of rice doesn't have weight, while a heap of rice has weight. Susan Carey was very smart in asking the children, and if you put the little uh, grain of rice on the uh, back of an ant, Will it have weight then? Oh yes, then it will have weight, because for the ant, uh, they, uh, they, uh, it will be hurt or whatever. So this is really uh, the difference between younger children and older children. Young children think that weight is feeling heavy, and therefore uh, they have just a different idea of the same conceptions. And of course, the children have a right to uh, consider this feeling of heaviness, and it's also important in everyday life. But uh, in physics classes, you want uh, children to understand weight a little bit different. Of course, they should keep this idea of feeling heavy or not feeling heavy, but of course, they have to go into the scientific direction. And this is what we try to encourage in a project on elementary school children. And uh, we want to start with science education at an earlier age. I think a lot of countries want to do it. But the problem, of course, is that uh, yeah, elementary school, there are very few elementary school teachers probably whose favorite subject at school has been physics. So a lot of elementary school teachers uh, are afraid of teaching physics, and they are right probably because they miss uh, important knowledge and what we know, of course, from, uh, from research on learning and instruction, uh, you only can teach what you have understood. So it really doesn't make sense to say elementary school teachers, you have now to start teaching physics. They probably re will read the textbooks in physics to the children, but of course we know this wouldn't uh, do anything good. So uh, yeah, we have to use time in uh, the 
the young children's time, the elementary, uh, elementary to, to school children's time in uh, building a basic conceptual understanding and the question is how this could work. And the idea behind it is of course the spiral curriculum. You start with certain experiences which are related to children's everyday life or at least to uh, things they already have seen and uh, you try to introduce some concepts, of course not by writing definitions on the blackboard, but by asking them questions which make sense to them. And this is what we are doing in the Swiss Mint study. It's supported by the Jacobs Foundation. And uh, the question we are asking, of course we are doing science, so we, do, uh, we aren't doing this just for educational purpose, but we want to answer questions which come from science. And uh, the main question is, are there long-term effects of physics education in primary schools? So will uh, yeah, young children who had gotten uh, yeah, a physics already in elementary school, Will they do better in physics in uh, secondary school, even if this instruction isn't optimal, just because they have developed a yeah, foundation of knowledge? And Switzerland provides good uh, quasi-experimental conditions for this kind of research, because uh, there is a tracking system in Switzerland. Students change classrooms very often, so we will have kind of natural control groups later on. We will have students who have undergone this uh, yeah, physics education in elementary school, and they can be compared to uh, students who just had standard uh, topics in uh, science classes, which are usually more on geography and biology. So what are we doing? Uh, just to, private, uh, to describe it very briefly, a colleague of mine, Kaledia Möller, she is a science uh, yeah, instructor. She had developed really four wonderful units which are appropriate for young children already on physics. Uh, they are dealing with floating and sinking. I will focus on this in detail, in, on air and air pressure, on sound, and on building bridges. And these are uh, units which uh, yeah, need at least eight uh, yeah, yeah, hours, uh, school hours for children to understand what's going on. And there is a lot of, uh, of course, hands-on and inquiry learning, but most importantly, it's guided instruction. Uh, in 2006, uh, we published an article in Journal of Educational Psychology, it's on your CD, where we compared uh, a more or less guided instruction on the unit of floating and sinking. And what we found was that in the long run, guided instruction is much better than just free discovery. We had a good condition of open instruction or free discovery, but in the long run, guided instruction is really the important thing. That's, uh, there, there, are a lot of, uh, there is a lot of evidence going in this direction. So currently, we, already, we started with elementary school children's learning on physics by training, and Ralf Schumacher and Leonard Schalk and some others did it, uh, with training 183 elementary school teachers in uh, yeah, conducting this uh, yeah, material on these four topics. And I trust these pictures already demonstrate how the unit on building bridges might uh, go on. Though the children really have to build bridges, they have to test uh, whether they really break down or not, uh, under which conditions. Uh, I don't uh, go into details. Unfortunately, these units are only available in German language. The one on uh, yeah, floating and sinking already is described quite intensively in this article, uh, which is on your CD. Uh, I, uh, as I said, I will focus a little bit more on this unit on floating and sinking. And uh, yeah, this gentleman, uh, yeah, you, I asked to talk about you, you in the break, you said you have to start with questions with, uh, which yeah, children could be interested in. I disagree that children always should ask their own questions because, uh, do you want me to tell something? We want you to bother with it slow, put the translation. Okay, okay, I speak too fast, I heard. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I will try to slow down a little bit. Uh, also in interest of time, I speed it up. Okay, so uh, if children are asked the question and all of them have already seen uh, boats or ships, why does this big and heavy ship made of iron uh, not sink, uh, while a little piece of iron will sink? 
children have easy answer to this question, easy answers to this question. One is, yeah, it has a captain or it has an engine. Of course, uh, this is not what physics teachers want to hear. It's clear they have uh, these boats have a uh, captain or they have an engine, but that's not uh, yeah really why it floats or uh, yeah why it doesn't sink. What we really want the children to come to is to understand uh, or to make a comparison between the weight of the ship and of the displayed wa displaced water. This is not quantitatively in this moment, it's only uh, just uh, getting an idea of how you do this kind of comparison, but it helps children to go into the right direction. And uh, just to show you uh, how, what kind of answers children, eight-year-old children give, uh, if you present them with problems like this, here are four balls of the same size. They all are of different weight, but none of them floats in water. How high does the water in the class rise with each ball draw lines uh, on uh, the water uh, levels? Typical answer of children is just this because they uh, haven't developed an understanding of density and uh, they are very focused on numbers and they uh, just uh, think that uh, yeah, the, the more heavier the ball is, the higher the water rises. Fortunately, with our unit on floating and sinking, where, as I said, the children have to do a lot of experiments, they have to conduct them, they have to compare different materials, the rate of uh, yeah, correct answers really goes up. And uh, this is uh, yeah, just one uh, goal of our instruction, that children develop basic concepts of consider weight as well as volume. Uh, probably to co also come a little bit to your question, we really try to look very uh, closely to, the lear to students' learning processes. And what we uh, yeah, found was there are certain yeah, steps on floating and sinking and there are, of course, misconceptions, this one-dimensional focus on weight, as I demonstrated it a minute ago, or on size or whatever, or sometimes they have the idea that air is active and pulls uh, the uh, water to the, to the ship to the top. Uh, there are some concepts which are not correct or not really satisfactory from a scientific point of view, and this is just an answer, the, uh, yeah, the if an object floats because it's made of wood or an object sinks because it's made of iron. This is not wrong, of course, but it's not a scientific explanation. Uh, but uh, we call them concepts of everyday life. Uh, the, uh, you can build on this kind of knowledge, you can further develop it, but if children don't get instruction, they will just stay with this kind of, um, uh, yeah, kind of explanations. And... Uh, yeah, uh, what we want them to uh, develop are concepts like, yeah, something is heavy for its size. This already goes in the right direction. Or uh, the, the highest level eight-year children can approach is the so-called explicit comparison uh, of an object's density with water displaced by it, uh, or of buoyancy force and weight. Of course, they don't use the word buoyancy force. That's too early for them. We don't want them to use difficult words they don't really understand. We really want them to understand the concepts. Uh, the uh, unit on floating and sinking, just to give you an impression, uh, we work with kind of with these uh, yeah, cubes, which help them to, uh, to understand that the same size or volume, uh, to be more correctly, uh, can, lead, uh, can nonetheless uh, go along with different weight. Of course, children have to weight things, they have to compare things, and this so on. This problem, the metal wire is in, immersed in water. What happens? Uh, students have to make an X for the correct answer, and then they have to select uh, yeah, which explanation is best. And to also come back to your uh, yeah, question about the interviews, all these uh, distractors, uh, they are not just, uh, they didn't grow, in, uh, grow up in our minds, but they are really answers children gave when we, we interviewed them. They say, yeah, it's, uh, it rises to the top because it's uh, so light, or because it's made of uh, metal, or because it's so long and thin. But at the end, fortunately, children either produce actively or they uh, cross the right answers 
because it's, uh, the displaced water weighs less than the metal wire or because it's not pushed uh, up strongly enough by the water. You, of course, this is not the answer. You could get an, a master's degree in physics at Harvard University, but it's at least compatible with uh, the uh, physics, with the correct physics, and therefore it's a good idea to push children in this direction. Uh, there, as I said, we have four uh, yeah, learning units. Uh, one is, for instance, does air have weight? There is a misconception in children uh, that air either has weight zero or even a negative weight. And by letting them weight this ball with and without air, they understand uh, it has weight. And this is, of course, also embedded in a bigger unit. Uh, and uh, because in interest of time, I just would like to uh, come to some results we already have. Uh, we have uh, yeah, extensive pre- and post-tests to see where, what kind of uh, knowledge children bring and what kind of knowledge they acquire. And here we have some interesting results which show the, uh, where we compare just for this purpose, it's not for a scientific study, but where we compare a third grade children, that means eight-year-old children, who have gotten trainings on air pressure and air or on sound, where they, for instance, learn that sound, a spreading of sound needs a medium. And we compare uh, the children, uh, eight-year-old children, to uh, about uh, 12 and 13-year-old children who didn't get instruction in this area. And what you can see is really that younger children who got instruction, they perform better than older children who didn't instruction. So, of course, you can say this is a trivial, but it's not really because uh, this kind of knowledge is not developed spontaneously. There is a lot of knowledge which is uh, developed spontaneously, but not knowledge in these areas. So, or also to come back to gender differences, we already saw them in Leonard's presentation. Uh, what we see is that uh, girls and boys uh, gain to the same extent, which is a very positive message because uh, all of us probably, are, all of us who are involved in science teaching, we are concerned about the little interest in these uh, topics in girls. And a way to uh, work against this uh, is probably to start earlier with science education. And uh, also these first results are very promising. So, uh, this is my last uh, yeah, slide. I just uh, briefly read uh, the conclusions. As I said, the, uh, these results are preliminary. We hope at the next IMBIS conf uh, conference we can already show that there are long-term effects of learning physics. But to, to have some general conclusions, uh, why should we start earlier with physics education? It's really to build knowledge that helps students to, uh, yeah, to use uh, for really abstracting and further extend the knowledge. Therefore, it's very important to uh, carefully select what kind of knowledge uh, children should learn. Uh, they should only focus on content that is also part of the lay curriculum in secondary school. And uh, yeah, this. Uh, and to come to your last question or the question we discussed in the break, I don't think, and uh, many others think, we should uh, students come up, uh, let come up with their own questions, but we should really think about questions that uh, yeah, they are aware why it's necessary to uh, ask them. They, of course, they have, uh, to have to understand why it's necessary to ask these kind of questions. But these questions uh, should uh, really um, yeah, be asked in a way that they make contact to, uh, to the rest of the curriculum the children have to expect uh, later on. Yeah, that's it. Thank you.